Okay, we're going to work on a couple different models for diastereoselective addition to carbonyl compounds. And here's just kind of a generic structure we're going to be working with. So we'll have an aldehyde or a ketone. And then at the alpha position, we're going to have a chiral center. And that's what gives us the diastereoselectivity in the product when we add a nucleophile to this. Um, you know, this also happens if you have chiral centers further down in the chain, um, but it's a little harder to predict in that case. So we're just dealing with cases where the chiral center is at the alpha carbon. Also, we're going to be dealing with strong nucleophiles like hydrides, so uh, sodium borohydride, lithium aluminum hydride, and um, carbon nucleophiles. So that could be like methyl lithium or phenyl magnesium bromide, something like that. There's two models we can use in predicting. Uh, we can use the Felconon model or the cram chelate model, and it just depends on um, your substrate and reagent to determine which model you need to use. So with the Felconon model, uh, this is kind of our base model where what we'll do is draw a reactive conformation in a Newman projection. And when we do this, what we're doing is viewing from the side of the carbonyl. So what we're going to do is view from the carbonyl side with the carbonyl carbon being the front carbon, the chiral center carbon being the back carbon of the Newman projection. So it'll look kind of like this, the front carbon will be your carbonyl. Here's on the carbonyl. And then you have your back carbon. So one of the keys to this is putting your largest group. So we have three substituents on the alpha carbon. We have R2, R3, R4. Now, since these are generic, we don't know which one is the largest, but basically we're going to classify them. We should have an R small, an R medium sized, and an R large. And you can generally use A values to determine which group's the largest. So what we end up doing is putting R large perpendicular to the carbonyl. Um, when we do some practice problems, we're going to draw two Newman projections, one putting it on the right, one putting it on the left. But what you want is the confirmation that then gives you R medium and R small, and you want R small down here at the bottom so that the nucleophile eclipses the smaller group along the bergy dunnitz trajectory. So when you draw the two Newman projections, the other one would have the medium-sized group at the bottom, and that's not the one you want to use because the eclipse between the nucleophile and R small is the preferred interaction. Now in some cases, we're going to need to use the cram chelate model. For this, what you need is a good group that can chelate at the alpha carbon. So just for example, we're still going to have a chiral center. Just do R1, R2, R3. But one of these groups needs to be your chelating group. So that could be something like a methoxy group or you know another common one dibenzylamine um, or even a sulfur group because that has lone pairs that can end up chelating with the metal but also you need a reagent that has a metal that can chelate um, or add you know, a chelating agent to the reaction, um, you know, something like titanium, magnesium, zinc, 
sometimes lithium, but I'm going to leave it off the list because it's um, probably more commonly it doesn't uh, chelate here. The R group. Here's our first practice problem. In this case, we have our chiral center at the alpha carbon. We don't have you know, a chelating atom, and the metal is sodium. That's not a good chelating metal. So this is just going to follow the simple Falconon model. And although typically you won't have to do this, in this case I gave you kind of a product template structure just so that when you check your answers, yours will be sure to match mine exactly. So in this case, what we want to do is, again, you know, think about a Newman projection viewing along the carbonyl. And I'll also go ahead and draw in the back hydrogen. So let's draw two Newman projections. That's what we always want to do. Okay, so the way that you know, this particular structure was drawn, the carbonyls pointed downward. That's fine. We can work with that. We'll put our C double bondo down on both. Okay, and then I'm going to draw on the back carbon perpendicular to the carbonyl is my R large group. Well, let's classify our groups. We have a tert butyl, an ethyl, and a hydrogen. And I think everybody would agree the tert butyl is the large group, the ethyl is our medium sized group, the hydrogen is the small group. Okay, so now if you are viewing along this bond, okay, we have our tert butyl group, let's draw that in. Then I'm going to draw my other two bonds for the substituents. Here's where you have to be careful you don't mess up. So on this back carbon, we have our tert butyl, and then if you go basically viewing in this direction going clockwise, you have the tert butyl, ethyl, hydrogen in a clockwise orientation. Tert butyl, ethyl, hydrogen. So now in your Newman projection, put those groups in a clockwise orientation. We have Tert butyl, next would be ethyl, next hydrogen. On our other one, still clockwise, tert butyl, ethyl, hydrogen. Oh, I almost forgot we have this methyl group on the carbonyl. We need to draw that in also. Okay. So now, here's our carbonyl carbon. The nucleophile needs to attack that from the side opposite R large. So that's going to be over here on this Newman projection, over here on this Newman projection, along the Bergy Dunnett's trajectory. So be careful, don't try to add that nucleophile like this because, you know, that's probably a 60 degree angle with the carbonyl. The Bergy Dunnett's trajectory is going to be this 107 degree trajectory like this. So it could add there or here. Well, which one eclipses the smaller atom? The one on the right. So that's how the nu nucleophile is going to add. So we're not going to use this one. We're going to use this one. Our nucleophile here is a hydride. 
So let's add that and draw the resulting Newman projection. What I'm going to do is keep the back carbon the same. All right, then the front carbon, let's just stagger these groups around. So we have the carbonyl becomes an OH. Then we have the hydride that added. So I'll put the H here. And then you have the methyl group there. Okay, so the next thing that I need is to get the groups that I want in the plane in the right orientation. So I want in my zigzag structure, terp-butyl, two carbons, methyl. So here is the terp-butyl, you have the two carbons of the Newman projection, and the methyl. Right, right now they're not in the right orientation. So what I want to do is rotate these groups so that you know, since this methyl is pointed kind of upward, I want it straight up on the new projection. Since terp-butyl is pointed downward in the zigzag, I want it straight down. So let's start with the front carbon. Right, I'm going to rotate the three groups on the front carbon Again, I'm not touching the back yet. Okay, here's my methyl straight up. OH and H. All right, so it's still not all that pretty but I have my front group the way I want it. So now I want the terp-butyl group pointed downward, anti to the methyl. So then I want to rotate the back carbon to get the terp-butyl down. So here I'm going to leave the front carbon the same. I'm not going to touch it. Then the back carbon. Now the terp butyl is here. Move the ethyl to here, hydrogen to here. Now that I have the methyl and terp butyl anti up and down, now they're set up to make my zigzag structure. So basically I'm viewing this Newman projection in this direction. Because that's going to put this carbon on my right, the back carbon on my left. And then these groups will be out near me, the viewer, these two groups will be back. So let's add that to our drawing up here. All right, so on this carbon containing the methyl group, I have an OH back and an H out. So I'll put the OH back. I'm going to leave the out hydrogen implied. All right. Then on the back carbon, which is the terp-butyl, for me, the viewer, I have a hydrogen back and an ethyl pointed out. So let's draw our out ethyl. Leave the hydrogen implied. Then this is our major product. as predicted by the Falconon model.
All right, in our second example, we have a chiral center at the alpha carbon, but now we have attached to the alpha carbon a methoxy group which can chelate. But in order for anything to really happen here, um, in terms of chelation, you need to have a metal that can chelate. Well, it just so happens we have the magnesium. So this is going to follow the cram chelate model. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and draw in my hydrogen so we can keep track of it. But what we need to do is, you know, if that magnesium is going to chelate the carbonyl oxygen and this oxygen, they need to be rotated um, so that they can all be in the same plane, um, up coordinating with the magnesium. So what I'm going to do is rotate around the carbon. So I'm going to put the methoxy group in the plane, the ethyl back, the hydrogen out. There's my methoxy. There's the ethyl back. Hydrogen out. Now we can draw our magnesium. That will chelate with the oxygens, keeping all of that in the same plane. So from here, now our nucleophile is methyl minus. We need to decide, you know, as it comes into the carbonyl, will it come in from the front or the back? Well, the front only has a hydrogen. The back has a larger ethyl group. So this will come in from the side of the smaller group from the front. So when you do that, I want to put the methyl on a wedge, and that will make the OH go back. And this chiral center stays the same. Okay, so we're essentially done. The only thing is, you'll notice in my structure, that was kind of the template structure, I wanted the ethyl group in the plane, so we need to rotate that back into position. So, just rotate these three groups back around. There's our ethyl, hydrogen back, methoxy out. So let's just put that onto our structure. Methyl, OH, methoxy. And now we've predicted the correct diastereomer using the Cram-Chelate model.